This morning we are in Hebrews chapter 11 where we have been, I want to say now it's been, this is our sixth sermon in this series looking at the faith of those who have come before us. As the author of Hebrews so far has been giving us a commentary on the book of Genesis. Hebrews chapter 11, we're moving now beyond Abraham to his wife, Sarah, to examine and observe the faith that Sarah had in a time of difficulty. So we are looking at, I, I, would, I would think would be considered a matriarch of our faith, as we have been looking at patriarchs of our faith. We now move on to look at the wife of Abraham and Sarah to find the transformation that happens within her faith upon the Word of God and the faithfulness of God in His promises. So Scripture is going to reveal to us this morning that all things are possible with God. Even bringing life to that where there could be no life, God does it. And bringing life to the dead. It is not impossible with God. The Hebrews chapter 11, this morning we're looking at two verses. It's verse 11 and verse 12. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Upon hearing the word of God, let us respond now in prayer. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in this moment that would, we would be humbled by the fact that we have your word in our midst. Your very word, Lord, that you breathed out fully inspired by your spirit and given to man that it would transcend time to meet us where we are today. That even here in this lesson that is given to the early church would be a lesson that is impactful for us, Lord, as we learn of your servants who have gone ahead of us in the example of their faith, Lord, I pray that even as you did within their faith, that you would reward those today who are found faithful. That you would bring blessing upon us in this moment through your word, that we would be encouraged, and Lord, that we would be inspired to live our lives in such a way that is pleasing to you, that we would give up offering to you in our worship, that we would give our lives to you in worship as well. And I pray that you would move me aside and allow your spirit to be our teacher today that this message that you have placed upon my heart would be given by your Spirit and move throughout each and every believer that is in this place and those, Lord, who do not yet believe. Bring transformation, bring revival, bring new life, and bring conviction in this moment as you have prepared our hearts to join together in this moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So we're now moving on into a portion of Hebrews 11. We've talked about Abel, we've talked about Enoch, we've talked about Noah, and we've talked about Abraham, and now we're moving on to the first woman that is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, but not the only woman that is mentioned. And we, we consider Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be the patriarchs of our faith, but we often forget, and as we should not forget, that they had mothers, and that of Sarah, and that of Rebekah, they had mothers who were prominent figures in the faith who, by their faith, were able to do amazing things. And looking at Sarah as a matriarch of our faith, we would find that it is by her faith she received power. And it is a specific power that is mentioned here. It is by faith that Sarah received power to conceive. And as the author of Hebrews is saying in a very polite way, is that she was beyond the age of being able to have a child. Now for this understanding, we would have to step back and go in to the book of Genesis. One of the first things that I find, and we're stepping back to Genesis, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 12. And so if you want to head back to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to kind of go through those first few chapters within Genesis 12 
all the way through 17 and beyond to 18. But when I read this verse, and maybe this is my own human fault, but when I read this verse and I read a line that says, by faith Sarah received power to conceive, for some reason the very first thing that comes to my human brain is the fact that Sarah laughed. Now maybe that doesn't mean much, but in my mind it means a lot. The fact that Sarah laughed when she was told she was going to have a child. And maybe the first thing, the first inclination on my side is to find fault in someone, which I hope that is not the case. I don't think that you would want a pastor who would find fault in the things that you do, but maybe that is a good thing for the pastor to have discernment to know and then guide you down the path that is led by Scripture. But I would say it's more of that side of humanity where we want to look at someone, even in a time of being uh, commended by God, and find fault in them. And that, unfortunately, was one of the first things I... But Sarah laughed. Now, for the context of this, let's go back. So Genesis chapter 12, we read of a call that is placed by God on Abram, whose name will be changed to Abraham. But not only was there a call on Abraham, there was also a call to his wife. And at that time, her name was Sarai, and her name is changed to Sarah later on. The call given to Abraham in Genesis 12 is that he would leave his home. And he gathered his things, and he left. But we don't forget the fact, we don't gloss over the fact, that Sarah went with him. Now, if I were to go and she does not want me to use her as illustrations in her sermons, but since she's in here, I feel like I can. If I were to go to Aaron and say, we just got to get up and go. We got to pack our stuff, take our kids, and leave. And then she would ask, where are we going? And I would say, I don't know. I don't know where we're going. But God's going to show me where we're going. I, may, I would hope... I would hope that her initial reaction is, let's go. But that's not going to be, I know that's not going to be the initial reaction. And that, that, uh, that's okay. That's okay. Because it's possible, maybe that wasn't Sarah's initial reaction either. But in order for her to step out in faith with her husband, who was stepping out in faith, we find that faith had to be there. So not only would Sarah have faith in her husband, but Sarah would have faith in the God who is directing them. So for her to step out shows a lot of faith in that moment. They take their belongings, they take Lot with them, and they're going to a place that Abraham has no idea where they're going, but God will show them. So they get up and they leave, and we automatically are seeing here the faith of Abraham, but not only Abraham, but the faith of Sarah to step out trusting the word of God. And then we move on to Genesis chapter 15. So let's skip ahead to Genesis chapter 15 in this commentary, the book of Genesis. We find Abraham is, is worried because he does not have an offspring. He does not have an heir of his own household. And so in his mind and in his heart, he is troubled. And he has a dream. And it is there in that dream that God is speaking to him. Abraham is told to get up and get out of his tent, to step out into the night air. And it is there in Genesis chapter 15 where God directs Abraham's eyes to the stars in heaven, to the stars in the sky. And it's there that he, he reaffirms this promise that Abraham will have a descendant, that, that will have an innumerable amount of descendants. You look up at the stars and Abraham, guess what? Your descendants will outnumber the stars. However many millions of them that there were, or there, that there still are, and then the descendants of Abraham, and Abraham, no, I don't, I don't have anybody of my household. And God reaffirms the promise, saying, no, this will be your offspring. And it would be Sarah who would have a child. And this seems rather impossible, because in a very polite way, we say, and we know, Sarah was wise in her years. And at the time that this was going on, she was an elderly woman. 
beyond the point of what would be considered, and I'm fumbling over the words, uh, menopause. But that we're not going to step further into that discussion. Then Genesis chapter 16. We find Sarah and Abraham are trying to rush the process. They're trying to put their plans before the plans of God, and we're like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll trust that God is going to keep his word, but we're not seeing it happening in our time, and we're not getting any younger. So Sarah gives her servant over to Abraham that they would have a child, and this would be the child who is the heir to Abraham, and then they would be the ones ushering in the fulfillment of the promise of God. But that did not go well. And I can speak from personal experience that when you try to put your plans before the plans of God, it will never go well. I mean... We often say patience is a virtue, right? Well, no, a virtue, okay, something you want to seek after. But actually, patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Something that is to be cultivated within you by the Spirit of God within your heart. And they, they, they were not patient. Not patient whatsoever. We're like, okay, we don't see God's hand moving at this time. So we're going to make it happen on our own terms. And we get to Genesis chapter 17. And then Genesis chapter 17, this is where God brings about the symbol of a covenant through circumcision and a promise. He gives a promise of the birth to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. And in that moment, God even says, you will give him the name Isaac. So not only is he saying, you're going to have a son, but I'm already going to give you his name. So that when your son is born, and not if your son is born, but when your son is born, you can call him by name. And that name is Isaac. But she laughs at God. In Genesis chapter 18. So stepping forward in Genesis chapter 18, we have a theophany of God. This means God has made himself present in the form of that people can see. One of the greatest theophanies of God is Jesus Christ. That God come down to earth to be as one of us. And here in Genesis chapter 18, we find a theophany of God in three men standing outside the tent of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is scurrying around to try to do whatever it is that he could do to make them at home, to make God at home. And he's given a task of things to do, and he goes about doing these tasks. And we read in Genesis chapter 18, verses 10 through 15, they're outside the tent. Abraham is scurrying around trying to find the things that he is instructed to do. Sarah stays in the tent as God declares in that moment that this time next year, Sarah will give birth to a son. That Sarah will give birth to Isaac. And then from within the tent, Sarah laughs to herself. And it possibly means that she didn't laugh out loud. And it could have been that she gave a little scoff or something on the inwardness of herself. But it says here, Genesis 18, that Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And then God on the outside of the tent speaking to Abraham, questions Abraham saying, why does Sarah laugh? Now, if this was an inward laugh and an inward thought, well, of course that would make sense because God could, put, could look into the heart of Sarah and know what's going on. And if it was an outward laugh, it'd be kind of weird why she would deny it because she denies it. And she says, no, I didn't laugh. And then God on the outside of the tent says to Sarah, nah, but you did. You did laugh. And that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a quote there in, chapter, in verse 15. No, but you did laugh. What? Here we have the author of Hebrews speaking about the great faith of those that have come before us and then is speaking of Sarah who laughed at a moment. 
where God is declaring something great over her life. And in my human brain, I want to think, oh, she had the audacity to laugh. But then, if I really bring it home, I realize that if any of us were put in that situation, and God were to show to us as clearly, as clearly as we could see, the plan that he has for us 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now, you know what we would probably do? We would probably laugh. And I can testify that I have done that. There was a Sunday five years ago, I think it's been five years, maybe six years, five years ago, when this church had a difficult time with the previous pastor. And it was a bit of a blow up that happened that day. And I witnessed that blow up. And I thought, man, this is not good. I kind of want to just open that door to the church and step out and maybe just shut it behind me and not come back. That's how bad it was. But then one man a very prominent figure, a pillar of this church, Houston Garvin, met me out there in the lobby, and he said to me, you are going to lead this church, and I laughed. I laughed, I didn't laugh at him, but I laughed at the notion, I laughed at the idea. After what I just saw, He said that to me. I laughed and I said three words. I hope not. (laughs) Clear as day, God used that great man, Houston Garvin, to present something to me that was going to happen later in my life. And I laughed. Why did I laugh? Because I thought it was absurd. I thought that's impossible. There's no way I could be the leader of this church. Not after what I just saw. There's no way. But God had other plans. And then I thought, you know what? No, I'm going to put my plans ahead of God's and I'm going to give this to somebody else. So I called all my pastor friends. I said, there's a church that needs a pastor. I need your help to find a pastor for this church because they're, they're calling me up to do it. And I got, no, 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 no. <laughs> And then I call my brother, who's a pastor and trains pastors. He said, Tip, this is your yes. Stop with the no. This is your call. Take it. And I said, no. (laughs) But I did. I tried to put my plans ahead of God's, but God had a different plan. And he saw it through. See, Sarah laughed in a moment of dis, not disbelief in what God could do, but disbelief in herself. Because at the time of, of Isaac's birth, Abraham is 100 years old. I mean, he, he's, he's well up there, and his wife is, is within her 90s when she is having a child. And to us, in our human brains, we're like, that is impossible. There's no way. But to God, nothing is impossible. That's what he says there when we go back to Genesis chapter 18. She laughed because of this impossibility. Genesis chapter 21. I want want you guys to notice this. In Genesis chapter 21, I'm going to read verses 5 and 7. And here's what happens to Sarah... 
her laughter changed. Remember, she laughed in in disbelief of the possibilities within herself, but her laughter changed in Genesis chapter 21, beginning in verse 5. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The name Isaac means one who laughs. And to Sarah was born one who laughs. Isaac would go on to have a son named Jacob And Jacob's name would be changed by God to Israel. It is incredible how God moves. It is incredible how God plans. It is incredible how God works. Because if it were not for Sarah, we would not have Jesus Christ. And God worked through Sarah, even through an impossibility of being able for a 90-something-year-old woman to give birth. And this is an an image of something that's going to happen later. This This is a neon sign pointing to something greater. Because then we have elderly motherhood of giving birth to a child in old age, But then we have a young woman giving birth to a child as a virgin. Glad all the kids are in here this morning for this sermon. A story of something impossible being possible in the hands of God. Sarah's laughter was transformed as we realize that her faith actually grew. Her faith was transformed as well. And then we see a continuation of these impossibilities being possible in the hands of God when we look at the image of Mary who Sarah represents. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37, we read, for nothing will be impossible with God. And this is at a time when a young woman is trying really hard in her mind to understand how she, a virgin, could give birth to a child. So the angel Gabriel comes to Mary for telling the birth of Jesus Christ, and Mary asks, how will this be since I am a virgin? And Gabriel then informs her that her cousin Elizabeth, who is the New Testament symbol of Sarah, and Mary as well, in her old age, Elizabeth, In her barren state, Elizabeth is going to conceive a child, and that child's name is John, who becomes the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Nothing is impossible with God. If Sarah can conceive, and Elizabeth, then Mary shall conceive even in her virgin state. And so then we find as we move on to verse 12 of Hebrews 11 that our faith advances God's purpose. So Hebrews 11, verse 12, Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So we're going back to Abraham. As God remained faithful to his word that through Abraham, who is that one man, through one man, And through Sarah, their descendants would have grown to an innumerable amount of people. And so church, look around. Because here's what we find today, is that we, the church, are those descendants. Now I could sit and count everybody that's in here this morning, and that doesn't feel like an innumerable amount of people, because I can put a number on it. But if you go back, I mean, you go back centuries, centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ, and we see a nation growing of people chosen by God 
And then, a mystery revealed to us in the New Testament that salvation is not only for the Jews, but it is for the Gentiles also. Then there's this explosion of individuals that are brought into the family of God. They are brought into the sheepfold. And we find the work of God's plan, His redemptive plan to bring His children back to Him. And the promise of heirs to an innumerable amount as it continues to grow even from this day forward. That through one man, God is bringing about His will, His purpose. And so when we see that word descendants there in verse 12, know that if you are in Christ, then your name is right there in that word descendant. And then if you are in Christ, being an heir to the promise, that is a promised land, that is heaven, being an heir to the promise, in Christ, you also, like Sarah, have received power. Power for the advancement of God's purpose. Just as Sarah was given the power to conceive, we, the church, are given power for the advancement of God's purpose. And this is how it began. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And this is Jesus speaking to 11 young men before He ascends to the Father. He says to His disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Power received through the Holy Spirit. See, with Sarah, there was power to bring life. And in the disciples of Jesus Christ, there is power of new life. With the advancement of God's purpose, these disciples are given the power through the Holy Spirit to speak. To speak utterances from the Spirit. To reveal mysteries that were not revealed yet. To grow the church. To grow the number of descendants. To bring others to new life. And you would think, oh, well, these men, uh, they were definitely qualified for this kind of work. Uh, no. <laughs> the qualification came from God choosing them and pulling them out of the world. The same with Abraham and his wife. And it was through faith that they received the power to be witnesses, meaning going out and telling of all the things that Jesus has done. So it is by faith we know that faith in Christ is essential, and with that faith comes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and in the Spirit we have power. What power? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is within all true believers. And so then we have the power to speak through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking through us to speak the words of Jesus Christ. The words that bring salvation and the only name that brings salvation and the words that bring new life. And it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit. No power of my own, but through the power of the Holy Spirit that is given through faith in Jesus Christ. That the inheritance of heaven would continue to outnumber the stars and grains of sand. And one more point that I want to make before we close out this, ser this service. There's that one phrase in verse 12 that hangs over me. After Abraham is acknowledged once more when the author of Hebrews says, from one man. Look what he says next. When he speaks of Abraham, he says, and him as good as dead. 
You see that? Abraham, as good as dead. And in those few words, we have a revelation that we are finite. And only God is infinite. Only God has the power to destroy what is and can be eternal. Now, if I were to die today, my soul would go on to be in eternity. But God has the power to destroy that soul. And only God has that power to make what is considered eternal no longer in existence. We are finite beings with an expiration date. And I stand before you no longer as good as dead. And here's why I can say that. Because in Jesus Christ, I have new life. I once was dead, but now I am made alive in Him. And I might be considered a finite being in that I am human. But I have great assurance knowing that by faith, through grace, by faith, by grace through faith, I am saved. Having faith in the one and only begotten Son of God, that who would ever believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. That though this mortal body would die, I yet will live, as Jesus Christ tells us in John chapter 11. It's impossible, we would think, for a 90-year-old woman to give birth, but it is not impossible with God. And it is impossible to think that a 100-year-old man would have an innumerable number of descendants, but it is not impossible with God. And it is impossible to think that a wretched man such as I would find a gracious and merciful Savior who would give me eternal life. But that is not impossible with God. We were all as good as dead, but God has given us Jesus Christ. Dead in our transgressions, but not anymore, for we have new life in Him. God has given us a spiritual resurrection that we would receive power in the Holy Spirit, that we would speak and we would testify and we would be witnesses of what He has done in our lives. And I want to shout it from the rooftops. I was as good as dead. I was as good as dead. But God made me new. And now I live to serve Him. And my question for you today is can you say the same?